evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. The U.S. scolding of North Korea reaches new levels. We're gonna behave. How escalating rhetoric can lead to real dangers. Where to lay blame when awful crimes are broadcast on social media. Prince Harry's lost years, denying his grief for his mother. Climate change reshapes the Arctic and fuels more climate change. Plus, shouting down debate on campus. Our own school isn't allowing a group to just have a discussion. The U.S. Vice President appeared to borrow a little of his boss's swagger today, making veiled threats against North Korea, warning it not to test the resolve of the Trump administration. Mike Pence made the comments during a visit to South Korea, in fact, while in the demilitarized zone between the two countries. Lindsay Duncombe has more on the escalating rhetoric and the response from Pyongyang. And the North Korean this is the posture and the language of a showdown. Vice President Mike Pence staring at North Korean soldiers with a message from the White House. The era of strategic patience is over. Uh, President Trump has made it clear that the patience of the United States and our allies in this region has run out. Apparently, as a warning, Pence mentioned recent American strikes on a Syrian airbase and the use of what's known as the mother of all bombs against ISIS in Afghanistan. North Korea would do well not to test his resolve or the strength of the armed forces of the United States in this region. The escalation in American rhetoric was countered with similarly dramatic words from North Korea. It has been created a dangerous situation in which the summer nuclear war may break out at any moment. A terrifying sentiment, especially when combined with the pictures of North Korea's new weapons and recent missile tests. But experts point out none of this means an imminent strike on either side. The North Koreans are not suicidal. They know if they attack the United States or South Korea preemptively, they would cease to exist. Despite Pence's stance today, America too seems poised for less violent action, likely tougher sanctions with the help of China. Since President Xi visited Trump earlier this month, the White House has talked cooperation. There's a lot of economic and political pressure points that I think China can, can utilize, and we've been very encouraged with the direction in which they're going. So, in many ways, this escalating conflict is similar to previous flashpoints between the two countries, with one big exception. This time, the American leader seems just as unpredictable as the North Korean one. <laughs> Donald Trump was asked about the situation at the White House Easter Egg Roll, an annual children's event. His response? We're gonna behave. <laughs> That's not helpful, according to people who study the conflict. Their concern is that all this tension could result in a mistake, twitchy soldiers misfiring or a missile test hitting an unplanned target. And that kind of escalation could be dangerous. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Donald Trump called Turkey's president today to congratulate him on his referendum win. Recep Tayyip Erdogan claimed victory in the vote that would expand his authority. Criticism and anger from his opponents was swift, and now some international voices are joining that chorus of concern. Neil Cooksall is in Istanbul with the latest. They're shouting, long live no. Pockets of protesters across Turkey refuse to accept yesterday's referendum results. In that vote, Turkish voters delivered a near even split. But the yes side won by a narrow margin. Both sides of the political spectrum are reeling. From somber last night, some suggested even stunned by how close the vote was. Tonight, Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan seemed recharged and ready for fresh battles. Already talking about the next elections in 2019, and when the country is still so divided, saying he could hold a referendum on the death penalty and another on whether to join the EU, all before this referendum is officially settled. Erdogan's yes campaign eked out a victory with just over 51% of the vote. 
On paper, that means Turkey's constitution will change. Its political system will switch from a parliamentary system to a presidential one and gives that president a longer list of powers. Without the checks and balances, opponents argue, to keep that person from becoming a dictator. <inaudible> Turkey's opposition parties aren't just disputing some of the results as they initially said last night. They now want the whole thing thrown out. International election observers say what they saw during the campaign is reason to worry. The two sides of the campaign did not have equal, equal opportunities. Even if the results survive all of the challenges, the ground has shifted slightly for Erdogan. He lost in key constituencies. But he is defiant still, saying to those questioning the results, we don't see them, we don't hear them, we don't know them. We'll continue on our path, he shouted. A path only half of the country seems to want to walk. Neve Göksal, CBC News, Istanbul. The search for the Cleveland man who committed murder and posted it on Facebook now covers five states. And as police hunt Steve Stevens, there are questions about how social media platforms handle violent and offensive material. The year is still young, and yet we've already seen several shocking crimes posted online. Fez Jamil explores the impact of all this on victims' families and the public. This is the horrific video that was posted to Facebook. We've chosen not to show the crime. In it, 74-year-old Robert Godwin is murdered randomly, allegedly because the shooter was upset with his girlfriend. Lasting less than a minute, the video has led to a manhunt across five U.S. states. The family is devastated, trying to make sense of it all. This man right here was a good man. And I just hate, I'm, I, I hate he's gone. Even Cleveland's police chief is struggling to understand the crime. You know, unfortunately, we're in an era where things like this happen. Uh, maybe not to this degree, maybe not this publicly. Many people have seen the video posted by the suspect, Steve Stevens. It was only online for three hours before Facebook removed it, but it spread like wildfire across the Internet. Today, the victim's grandson posted a plea on Twitter for people to stop sharing the video. This isn't the first violent or explicit video to be posted. In March, the sexual assault of a 15-year-old girl in Chicago was streamed live on Facebook. So was the vicious assault on a mentally disabled man in January. In response to this most recent case, Facebook said in a statement, this is a horrific crime and we do not allow this kind of content on Facebook. We work hard to keep a safe environment on Facebook. However, some say social media companies need to do more to give users the ability to raise the alarm. There should be a button that you can press that says there is a crime taking place in this video and it needs to be taken down immediately. There are also questions whether the public share some responsibility in this type of disturbing behavior. Sometimes the audience feels remote from the pain that's happening and the person who is either harming themselves or harming others feels emboldened by having this audience. So when you have this conjunction of an audience that feels less responsible for what's happening uh, and a perpetrator who feels more empowered by having this audience, I think things can go south very quickly. Experts say in the age of technology growth, social media and people's natural curiosity, crimes like this one may likely happen again. Fez Jamil, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up. I wasn't used to being called a violent misogynist. Starting a group to discuss men's issues made them a target for scorn. We examine the state of campus debate. Plus, as climate change takes hold, Arctic life gets even more complex. American authorities are showing off what caught their eye during a security breach that caused hours of delays at Toronto's Pearson Airport earlier this month. This, found in a passenger's bag, was called a mock improvised explosive device by officials. The passenger's wife says it's an alarm clock. The man was traveling home to Chicago from Brazil. The flight was delayed for more than eight hours while bags were rescreened. After testing, no explosives were found but the man is charged with mischief. Firefighters in Alberta had a large-scale rescue operation on their hands after 10 horses fell into icy waters. The emergency crew used chainsaws to cut a pathway in the ice and then helped the horses to safety. The entire operation took about two hours. 
Sadly, three of the horses later died from the ordeal. The seven surviving horses are in good shape and should be okay. An ongoing investigation from our Go Public team has revealed some questionable practices at the big banks. Staff are told to put sales quotas and shareholders first. As it turns out, there's no obligation for financial advisors to act in your best interest. But there are calls for that to change. Erica Johnson has that tonight. Head into any bank, insurance company, brokerage. The vast majority of people giving financial advice in Canada only have to meet what's called a suitability standard. Is a product or service suitable for a client? A term that's open to interpretation. This former BMO advisor is one of hundreds of bank employees who tell Go Public they're pressured to sell products that help the bank more than the customer, like high-fee mutual funds. I would go home and I'll, I'll, I'll constantly think and question myself that if this was one of my own family members or friends, would I actually tell them to do this? For instance, if you put 100000 into a mutual fund and it grows an average 6% a year for 25 years, that nest egg will be worth more than 446000 But if a financial advisor puts you into a mutual fund with a 2% management fee, half your profit will go to the advisor and fund manager. They don't have to suggest a lower fee fund or even an index fund with minimal fees that historically performs just as well. Consumer advocates say it's time Canada's financial regulators introduce what's called a statutory best interest standard. Every day that goes by, Canadians are spending much more on fees than they should be spending. A best interest standard would require anyone giving financial advice to always act in a client's best interest. The UK and Australia have a best interest standard. It's coming to the EU in January. Since 2012, there have been two national consultations for provincial regulators and an industry roundtable. But there's still widespread disagreement. It will deliver to Canadians the kind of prof financial professional services that they think they're getting now and that they deserve. Ontario seems to be leading the way. The Ontario Securities Commission supports a best interest standard, as does Ontario's finance minister. But regulators in BC, Alberta and Quebec support the status quo. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. If you have more details about our ongoing investigation on banks or want to go public with a story of your own, Get in touch with Erica and her team. Send an email to gopublic at cbcnews.ca. You may want to check your cupboards tonight to see if flour you own has been added to a massive recall that's been expanded once again. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says another 16 products could be unsafe. It's more Robin Hood and Creative Baker brand flour. The CFIA says it's possibly contaminated with E. coli and should not be used or consumed. We have a full list of the recalled products affected at cbcnews.ca. Prince Harry is famously private about his personal life. Many have tried and failed to get him to open up about his feelings and his relationships. But now, the young man, who is fifth in line to the British throne, is being surprisingly frank about his most formative relationship with the mother he lost 20 years ago. Cass Rusi has more on Harry's decision to talk about Diana's death and just how badly it wounded him. The media attention was inevitable and insatiable. No. Some dribbling, you want to... The second son born to Prince Charles and Princess yeah. Diana. Now Prince Harry has opened up to a British newspaper giving a frank and candid podcast interview. Revealing for the first time, publicly at least, how he struggled with his mental health following his mother's death. I can safely say that losing my mum at the age of 12 and therefore shutting down all of my emotions for the last 20 years has had a quite serious effect on, on not only my personal life but also my work as well. Princess Diana was killed in a car crash in Paris in 1997. Prince Harry now admits not talking about the tragedy was the only way he knew how to deal with it. My way of dealing with it was, yeah, sticking my head in the sand, refusing to ever think about my mum because why, why would that help? It's only yeah. going to make you sad. It's not going to bring her back. So I was a typical sort of 20, 25, you know, 28-year-old running around going, you know, life is great, you know, life is fine. 
those years spent displaying very public bad boy behavior. Today, Prince Harry says there were repercussions to ignoring the anguish he felt over his mother's death. Um, I've probably been, been very close to, to a complete breakdown on, on numerous occasions. It was only in the last two to three years of what Prince Harry calls total chaos that he sought counselling, crediting his big brother for that. You know, for me personally, you know, my, my brother, you know, bless him, he was a huge support to me and kept saying, you know, this is not right, this is not normal, you need to talk about stuff, it's okay. Mental health advocates have applauded Harry's efforts in coming to terms with his personal struggles. So when people like Prince Harry and others speak up about their own experiences, it gives uh, people, the average people, um, permission to do it too. It, it lets them know that it's okay to speak up, uh, no matter what your position is, no matter what your experience has been. This is Canada. Everything happens on ice, doesn't it? <laughs> now 32, Prince Harry says he's in a good place, involved with charities, including the Invictus Games, a sporting event for disabled soldiers, and heads together a campaign that promotes mental health and one Prince Harry hopes will help remove the stigma surrounding mental health illness. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Some 30,000 people from around the world hit the streets of Boston today for the 121st running of that city's famous marathon. And they're underway. It was runners from Kenya who won both the men's and women's legs of the race. This year's Boston Marathon saw tight security and some living history. 50 years ago, Catherine Switzer broke the men-only rule to become Boston's first female competitor. Today, she raced again. Her race bib number, 261, has now been officially retired in tribute. And thousands of people also hit the streets of Paris over the weekend for the annual 5K color run along the banks of the Seine. Racers were doused in vibrant colors just for the fun of it, as is the custom. This year, 20,000 people took part before throwing a huge party near the Eiffel Tower. Straight ahead, a vicious circle in Canada's north. The impact of climate change is fueling even more of it. new life for more than 250 people. The Arusa Sun carries refugees from Hungary, those who fought against a tyrannical government and then fled when their cause was crushed by Russian tanks. More than 3,000 people jammed the dockyard to shout their welcome. And they marched down the liner's gangplank onto Canadian soil, accompanied by the music of the Royal 22nd Regiment's band. Canada is one of the few countries accepting Vietnamese refugees. Under our present quota, by the end of the year, we will have taken 2,000 from Hong Kong. For the past six months, it's been up to a dedicated 22-year-old Montrealer, Scott Mullen, to decide who gets in and who doesn't. OK, we will accept his application to go to Canada. How do you know they can adapt to Canada? Well, if somebody can sail across the South China Sea and spend two months on sea, a few months here in a camp situation like this, I think they'll be able to adapt reasonably well. Noontime, and the would-be refugees are allowed outside for an hour. When the hour is up, they go back, single file, into the stuffy gymnasium that is their home. The Canadian government hasn't had to publicly explain why it's detaining these people for so long, except to say that it doesn't yet know for sure who they really are or whether they'll show up for their immigration hearings. All of the other illegal immigrants that have come here, they haven't been treated that way. The uh, turbans and beards are a great influence. Members of the local Sikh community are upset with the way the government and the way the Canadian public has reacted to this latest boatload of people. This is the image that stands out most in people's minds. I think they should ship them all back where they come from. Canada will give political asylum to 26,000 Yugoslavian refugees. While it's welcome news, refugee advocates say the Canadian government is playing a dangerous double standard. They say refugees from Somalia should get the same treatment as those from Yugoslavia. As we know, the civil war and also the famine has displaced millions of people. We want justice! Yesterday, Somalis protested outside of immigration offices calling for fair treatment. But Somalia is more than Sarajevo. So if they don't give it down to Somalia... Different language, different culture, different lives. You can see the strain on so many faces. 
crammed into a gymnasium, the refugees listen to the Prime Minister explain he hopes they can one day return to their homeland if they choose. And I'm sure that you can feel at home among us. You're looking at the first ever documented case of the phenomenon known as river piracy. First one in modern history, and it happened in Canada's north. Research released today shows that a river that flowed from a giant glacier vanished over four days last spring. For centuries, the Slims carried water from the Kaskawolsh Glacier northwards. But now that water is flowing south. Over time, meltwater carved a new canyon to a lower elevation and last spring, intense melting of the glacier tipped the balance of the drainage system, making this river go dry. That's not the only way climate change is altering Canada's landscape. The ground under the far north is also shifting. As it turns out, permafrost isn't that permanent. It's melting at a faster rate than previously thought. And all that thawing is actually contributing to global warming. The CBC's David Common explains. Hard to believe at minus 20, but the ground under these Inuit kids is melting. It's happening fast across Canada's Arctic. And as a result, the earth is sinking. The ground was level right there with the, uh, with the landing of the stairways. In less than three decades, Merv Grubin has seen big change. Say 60, 70 centimeters, good two, two and a half feet. But this, this is just some, some areas. There's a lot of other areas that are uh, more extreme. More than a third of Canada's landmass is permafrost, a mixture of ice and sediment dating back to the last ice age. But after 10,000 years, climate change is now prompting thaw. The ground is sinking, creating new lakes and landslides. They're really, um, really remarkable changes that have happened in a very short amount of time. For researchers, it's a double whammy. Permafrost is a carbon sink, so the melt releases emissions over a vast area. <laughs> and the worst of it is methane, now bubbling out from permafrost from under Arctic lakes. It's flammable, but also a key greenhouse gas. So we have sort of this feedback that we're seeing cl um, climate change affect permafrost and the permafrost degradation enhancing the, the climate change. Out with Anuvik's mayor, it's a tour of the thaw's impacts. Here, a prematurely closed detention center. Over the years, it's actually started to slide off of its foundation. And a soon-to-be demolished warehouse where piles driven deep into the permafrost have shifted. The freezing is, is, is pushing this pile here on the corner up and you can see how it's, just, it's pushed it up right off of the other piles there. At the newest building in town, the RCMP detachment sits on deep piles which are actually refrigerators and can be super cooled if permafrost thaw becomes more severe connection point there for the mechanical refrigeration system if they needed it so they could uh, if there was some thaw or melt there they could uh, connect the system to it and refreeze it yeah not everyone has the money needed to do that so they're building their homes on beams burrowed deeper into the earth 20 years ago piles needed only six meters to be driven into the ground today 15 meters is needed to find the stability above that is thawing all this, of course, adds expense to a region facing the greatest impacts of climate change. It's not just melting ice caps affecting the Arctic. The ground, too, is warming and changing. Obviously, you can't really stop the permafrost melting because it's all uh, over the circumpolar world. Best thing is to just try to slow down the emissions, CO2. And those emissions come almost entirely from places other than right here. David Coleman, CBC News, in Nuvek, in the Northwest Territories. India is also hotter than normal for this time of year, and temperatures this hot in April have some worried about what's to come in summer. Several northern and central states have been under heat wave alert since yesterday, with temperatures in the 40s. The hottest region registered 46 degrees. It's expected the very hot, very dry weather will continue for several days. 
Up next, heated exchanges that can stifle campus debate. We meet people who say some views aren't worth hearing and others who struggle to be heard. Plus, why people in Utah want to close down a new national park. government could do. Mitchell Sharp told us to pray. Well, we're not going to, we're not only going to pray, we're going to fill the streets. When we look back on student activism of decades past, we may tend to see a feel-good story. Righteous youth confront the status quo to champion human rights or to shed light on the terrible toll of war. 
It's a different story today, according to some critics. Too often, they say, groups try to drown out certain viewpoints or certain people, so there's no debate at all. Tonight, Lorena Redekop looks at recent clashes where the overriding message seems to be, not on my campus. It's easy to idealize life on a university campus. It's data that we collect for ourselves. Intellectual discussions. Debating ideas. Hearing new perspectives. But it's an ideal that seems out of reach for some people. Students say they're being censored, not even allowed to bring up controversial points of view, like here at Ryerson University. I kind of came to the university thinking that it was a place where people could freely exchange ideas, push boundaries, but it was really just this padded room where everybody's trying to control a message under the guise of making everyone safe which is BS, honestly. Kevin Ariola started the Men's Issues Awareness Society. It hasn't helped with his popularity on campus. Sorry. The group is confined to meeting in this tiny room. It's more like a closet. They're stuck here because the students' union refused to give the group official status, calling it anti-feminist. So provide a fathering after separation program. Ironically, women make up most of the group. Hopefully we can dismantle some of the ideas that people have about the group. Ariola just wanted a space for students to talk about problems affecting men. I've seen a lot of abuse happen to men in my own family. Like I, I know a few young men that have committed suicide. We tackled, you know, men's mental health. After the student uh, union raised the alarm, he became a target. It was this event held by the Feminist Collective, and I was passing by. I think I stood around for maybe like 10 minutes. And then I see in the paper the next day that the Feminist Collective had said that my presence there had made the space unsafe, that, that I was dangerous. I wasn't used to being called a violent misogynist. All the publicity on campus turned him into the face of a movement despised by some students. It was a lot of pressure. I, I wasn't used to it. It all just kind of snowballed into me becoming a giant mess. I started drinking quite a bit um, and not talking to anybody about it. So that was my own man's issue. Ariola is now taking on the student union. We don't want to. We don't want to make people feel that. Oh, I've had a bad experience. Here. Men's groups are part of the new frontier That's in the fight over point. censorship. Um, that was something I was fearful of. What happens on campuses can define generations. Debates have raged for decades over what people are allowed to say or do at a university. At the root, it's usually a question over the role of a student union or university in protecting people. And some conflicts keep coming back. Abortion is one example. Life starts when the child's Not just the controversy over whether they should be legal, but what people can express. People clashed at UBC almost 20 years ago. This is an issue of not freedom of speech, but of hatred, and I believe this is hate literature. And now, at the University of Alberta, a new fight has flared up on that same issue. Education student Amberly Nickel heads the campus pro-life group. It's me. Two years ago, her group set up a graphic display in the middle of campus. Loud protesters moved right in front of them. Our signs were pretty tall, but uh, their bed sheets and signs were even taller, and so okay. it made it very difficult to see what was going on. And you guys were just in this area here. Mm -hmm. Nickel says those protesters broke the student code of conduct by blocking their display. Your images are lies! While security did nothing. 
Neither, she says, did the university administration. That's who she's now fighting. The next time she tried to hold an event, it told her she'd have to pay more than $17,000 for security. I feel like that amounted to censorship. If you put a price tag on free speech by saying um, the more controversial you are, the more you have to pay for security fees, right? Um, that immediately shuts down discourse for people who are either too unpopular or too poor to have their voices heard on campus. The university administration wouldn't talk about this case, but it says security fees are something all groups have to pay if they hold an event where things could blow up. They sure did in Berkeley, California this past February. A student protest turned into a riot after campus conservatives invited Milo Yiannopoulos to speak. He's a far-right commentator, critical of feminism and Islam. No, it's not free speech, it's hate speech. Some call it mob censorship. Others would probably say it's activists trying to affect change. There are multiple cases here in Canada as well. We got those fascists out of here. Zach. Like when the rebel Except media founder Ezra Levant speaks at a university. He has views on Islam that some say cross the line. And what's so funny is Here he is at Ryerson in March. If you look in cities like Rotterdam, the second city of Holland, the Muslim population is... This is at the University of Toronto a month earlier. You go to Black Lives Matter, which is mostly white in Toronto. You go to... I went to an I don't know more protest. It was about 100 people and there were only about three Aboriginal, well, there's a shock. There's a complete shock. Someone called the fire alarm. Outside in the hallway, anger. How dare you bring my parents in Cassandra Williams in the black hoodie was protesting that day. She's also part of the students' union. She says free speech is sometimes used as an excuse, allowing people to express views that are racist or transphobic. It's just a lie, really, to claim that some of these things are like free and like genuine debates. Every time some like hateful person decides to get up and say, you know what, trans people don't deserve rights, or um, members of this racialized community are less human. Every single time someone says that, we do not need to immediately turn to them and consider their opinion. Yeah. We'll help to reclaim space on campus. As a transgender woman, she's felt hurt and singled out. It's over a bitter dispute on campus. Spurred on by the views of psychology professor Jordan Peterson. He's a cult hero to free speech advocates, but his detractors are just as passionate. They drowned out his talk at McMaster University in March. Peterson frequently speaks out against a proposed federal bill, C-16. It would amend human rights law, so you can't discriminate against people based on their gender identity or expression. But Peterson sees it as a threat to free speech, because it would force him to address people by their preferred gender pronouns. It's the first time I've seen in our legislative history where people are attempting to make us speak their language. Check out this rally for free speech on the U of T campus. Peterson was the main attraction. This event propelled him into the spotlight. The radical left activists are trying to turn this into an argument about sexual politics. And it's only nominally about sexual politics. It's about language that's designed to control our freedom of expression. Peterson's opponents showed up. They tampered with the speakers, trying to prevent him from being heard. One of Peterson's supporters had enough. We need some men here, people. Men need to stop this nonsense. He's brilliant. Badly! Sometimes they go much further than Peterson does, like during the rally's open mic session, this rant about transgender people. Do you think people love them? Do you think they're hugged and taken care of? Do you think people love those people? Do you think they're listened to? No! But tattooing your body and cutting off your genitals.
if a person is coming at this topic from the perspective that trans people are deviant, they're irrational, they're mentally ill, they're not deserving of the same rights and consideration as everyone else, then there's no debate to even be had. It's the idea that certain things are so offensive and so triggering that we can't talk about it. After organizing that rally for Professor Peterson, Jeff Liu started a club at the U of T. Thank you very much for coming out. Called Students in Support of Free Speech. This is an extremely contentious topic. He resists the idea that speech should be limited to protect people. I have a lot of sympathy and empathy for those who are marginalized. Mm -hmm. However, does it mean that we baby them? Does it mean that they cannot withstand any criticism? Or does it mean we cannot discuss issues that surround those marginalized or vulnerable community, even if it is uh, not to their benefit in the short term or even if it offends them. His version of free speech is especially broad. It would even make room for something that could be considered a crime, inciting genocide. He's seen it online against transgender people. I think those are reprehensible things and I would argue with that person and I'd say that person's ignorant, perhaps even vile. but. Um, as far as condemn, condemning them and using the power of the law against them, I don't think it's reasonable to do that either. Is it the university that was... Shaheen Imtiaz is the student union's vice president of campus life. For her, limiting what people can say is about keeping others safe. Sexist comments and transphobic comments. She says some groups, like pro-life and men's clubs, just shouldn't form at universities. The student union is a nonprofit organization. We do have the right to um, not um, recognize groups on campus that we think are not um, working to the benefit of, of like the larger campus. We exist so that students who are not being taken care of, students who are being marginalized, can have a space and can have a voice. Universities should provide a safe space from assault, from physical harm. Uh, but not a safe space from feeling upset about ideas you disagree with. I mean, the university should have one big... Lawyer John Carpe feels so passionately about free speech, he started a law firm in Calgary focused on it. No gleaming office tower for him. He runs the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms out of this basic two-bedroom apartment. His line on free speech is the criminal code. If you're calling for any person or group of people to be murdered or to have their houses burned down or to be robbed or assaulted, that's already illegal criminal speech. So there's already a healthy boundary there. Carpe is now representing both the anti-abortion group in Edmonton and the men's issues group at Ryerson. Both have issued court challenges, claiming their speech was muzzled. Carpe's organization puts together what it calls a campus freedom index. It tracks incidents of censorship on campuses all across the country. Well, it's in bad shape. It looks to be getting worse. It seems to be, it might get worse before it gets better. Free speech isn't just um, being able to voice an, an idea. It's about being able to choose how that idea is voiced, right? Amberly Nickel graduates this year, so she won't even be part of the anti-abortion group once the legal case is decided. For her, this is about creating change for the next generation of students, so they don't have to face the same challenges. Everything worth discussing in this life tends to be controversial, and if we can't discuss those controversial issues, then how are we ever supposed to move forward as a society? Back at Ryerson, there's a new president of the Men's Issues Awareness Society now. Kevin Ariola is still involved, but needed some space. It's now a woman in charge of tackling men's issues. She plans to apply again for official group status. I just, I got really frustrated when I heard about with what happened to Kevin. So it just became more of an issue with me that, you know, our own school isn't allowing a group to talk about, to just have a discussion. I've taken a step back. Not having his group recognized by the students' union has had a big impact on Ariola. This really opened my eyes and made me realize that um, you know, all speech should be protected. You know, today it's me that can't talk about men's issues and men's mental health. Um, you know, tomorrow it might be another group. I, I wouldn't say we can't have a space where both groups uh, mm -hmm. yeah. get together. And at a recent meeting, so two like, people showed up to express their concerns the about the group. I was just worried that it would be um, an anti-feminist space. In, which... in the end, they all talked uh, and listened. I think from my perspective, uh, you've already somewhat ameliorated my fears about what this was going to be. It's just one group on one night. 
but they did manage to find some common ground. I, I, I honestly don't really have words. There's a couple of times that I, I almost teared up in the, this meeting and all the ideas that have come out. Uh, it's, really, it's really nice. That's, that's all I got to say. Confronting those you disagree with, debating, it doesn't always result in a consensus. But when you're willing to hear opposing views, difficult ideas, maybe that academic ideal can be reached. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. As we searched our archives for vintage protests, we found there's nothing new about a clash of opinions on campus. Take a look. An anti-war demonstration at the University of Toronto runs into stiff opposition from the university's engineering students. 500 anti-war demonstrators who were protesting against Canadian firms supplying war materials to the United States were pelted with snowballs and eggs. Several small fights broke out as the two groups came together. Coming up, Indigenous groups help to create a new U.S. national park. Now some people want to shut it down.
A big fight is brewing in Utah over a national monument and natural resources. Bears Ears was proclaimed a protected area last year by Barack Obama. From afar, its vistas are breathtaking. Get up close and you see its historical and cultural significance. But now, some are asking President Trump to rescind its protected status so what's underneath can be extracted. Kim Brunhuber reports. The view from atop Cedar Mesa in southeastern Utah. Below stretches America's newest national park called Bears Ears. It's almost as big as Prince Edward Island. Five and a half thousand square kilometers of canyons, mesas, and reddish beige desert. Barack Obama created Bears Ears as one of his last acts as president. But long before the park was officially born at the end of last year, many in the state were already trying to kill it. Nicole Holliday comes from a ranching family in a nearby town called Blanding. She fought against the park. So did Utah's Republican government, upset the area would be cut off from development and oil and gas extraction. For one man to strike his pen and take over a million acres, like, holy cow. But there is a whole other view of this land, an older view. There's a lot of onions out here, we couldn't find any. Every week or so, Jonah Yellowman comes to Bears Ears to collect medicinal herbs, but he always finds more than just the sage he's looking for. Right here. Bits of pottery and tools, he says, from the indigenous people who lived here many generations ago. It's all over the place around here. So be careful where you step sometimes. Bears Ears has thousands of ancient burial grounds, cultural sites, and rock art that go back millennia. It's something that we're trying to preserve, you know, it's spiritual, it's uh, our ancestors, they're still here. To see exactly why this land needs federal protection, I clamber along a steep cliff trail with Navajo elder Mark Maryboy. He helped unite five indigenous tribes to submit a proposal for this park. He takes me to one of the most spectacular ancient petroglyphs known as the Wolfman Panel. So all of those holes there, those are bullet holes? Those are bullet holes uh, made by a high part rifle. There's uh, over 100,000 sites, and many of those locations, you see the similar bullet holes. Other cultural sites have been looted, even hacked off with power saws. Now local tribes get a say in how Bears Ears is managed, and that's one of the reasons some Utahns are so dead set against the park. They're gonna start restricting it, restricting access, restricting the freedoms that we already enjoy up there. And it's not the first time, he says. About 20 years ago, Utah legislators tried to get rid of another new national monument, one created by President Clinton. That effort didn't go anywhere, but this time around, they have a friendly ear in the White House. President Trump has spoken of allowing drilling in national parks, and Utah's lawmakers have asked him to rescind the monument, but it won't be easy. Obama used something called the Antiquities Act to create the parks. The law from 1906 gives presidents the power to create protected areas, but not undo them. If Trump can't get rid of Bears Ears, Utah's Republican lawmakers have suggested he shrink it or simply stop funding it. Environmentalists say if that happens, they're ready to defend Bears Ears in court. An attack on one national park makes all of them vulnerable. All citizens of the United States have a stake and vested interest in protecting these areas. Back with Yellow Man, we come across more traces of his roots. That's a Hogan. I, I was raised in one of those. Yellow Man says this one was built before white settlers came. His people lost this land once already, he says. He can't help but feel like it could happen again. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, near Bears Ears Monument, Utah. We want to correct something from last night's program. In a segment about the United Airlines PR disaster, we reported that Donald Trump tweeted support for an online boycott of the company. That's actually not the case. So we wanted to set the record straight. Coming up, signs of spring in very different places. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX rose 149 points. The dollar stayed the same. In New York, the Dow was up 183 points and the price of oil fell 43 cents a barrel.
I'm Dave Seglins. Tomorrow on The Current, after her son died in an unlicensed daycare, Shelley Shepard campaigned to overhaul BC's system by sending a letter mother to mother to Premier Christy Clark. Her story on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. They have never seen anything like it around the Lincoln Memorial or, for that matter, anywhere else here in the capital of the United States. We lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time. This park area on the Washington Mall, right underneath the Capitol Dome, has been the gathering place for many demonstrations but none quite so strange as this collection of uniformed veterans complete with medals and toy machine guns. The anti-war movement in this country is an ever-changing phenomenon. You never know quite what to expect next. William H. Carroll from Atlanta, Georgia. 26 air medals and all the other stuff that goes with it. Washington was the scene today of the largest anti-nuclear demonstration ever held in the U.S. If you're not building for the future, you're stealing from it. They call the Supreme Court decision a tragic mistake. And on this, the 10th anniversary of legalized abortions, 26,000 marchers vowed to begin a second decade of protest. Organizers are calling it the biggest pro-choice rally in history. We will never give up. We will never give up. We will never give in. We will never give in. From Capitol Hill to the Washington Monument, they formed an awesome mass of people. Not the million and a half the organizers claimed, but the largest ever gathering of black Americans. We're not here to tear down America. America is tearing itself down. We are here to rebuild the wasted cities. This was exactly the image organizers wanted, a pageant of Americans before a national icon. Glenn Summoned by a political commentator and a champion of conservatives. This day is a day that we can start the heart of America again. Look around you, you're not alone. You are Americans. The National. The National. Tonight. It is actually spring in snowstorm battered Newfoundland. And here's the proof. Giant drifting icebergs off the Newfoundland coast are considered a sign of the season. A massive one near the town of Fairyland has become a temporary tourist attraction. Locals have even complained of roadblocks from so many people stopping to look. Meanwhile, in Saskatchewan, beavers seem to be switching careers, this particular one anyway. A rancher stumbled across this scene the other day and was stunned. But over time, she realized the beaver was not actually hurting her cows. Rather, it was trying to get the curious bovines to just back off and go follow someone else around. And an American spring tradition took place today, the annual Easter egg roll at the White House. In keeping with the tradition, the president himself got things underway. And I don't know if we're going to be successful, but I know a lot of people down there are going to be successful. I've seen those kids, and they're highly, highly competitive. That I can tell you. 
President Trump also showcased his deft approach to handling sensitive documents. In this case, some work from the coloring table he found quite striking. All in all, thousands of kids and their families took part in today's festivities. And that's The National for this Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.